Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to give you an overview on uh, material migration in JET with the Eterlite wall and its impact on um, diagnostics. This is work of many people um, operating in JET, mainly the JET2 um, Eurofusion project, but also some other um, information in here. So JET um, started operating with its Eterlite wall in 2010. This is JET on the, here on the left. And we have a beryllium main chamber wall and a tungsten diverter. So the main chamber is here, diverter is here. And <clears throat> the aim of operating with this wall is to understand material migration, fuel retention, recycling in ETA relevant conditions, because ETA will also operate with a beryllium wall and a tungsten diverter. So looking in a bit more detail, uh, we have beryllium in the main chamber here, shown in green, all around these regions here, but also these blue areas are in canal samples coated in beryllium. And then in the diverter, our tungsten uh, surfaces are carbon fiber composite uh, substrates with tungsten coating and solid tungsten right at the bottom here. The main chamber is made from in canal, so we also have sources of iron machine. Um, we operate JET um, in cycles, so we have operating periods which last from a year to two years, roughly 18 months I guess, um, running around 20 hours of plasma time, um, different input energies over the campaign. Um, we've had three cycles now, each like wall one, two and three, and these are the years that they ran. And um, we've been getting higher power as we've been going on with the, um, with the experiments, and we've also operated in the hydrogen. In between these cycles, we take out components, and we analyze these. We do extensive surface analysis, and this is where most of the uh, results you'll see today are drawn from. So um, this is the area that I'll be concentrating on. So the analysis of these tiles is a large international effort. So we have uh, samples distributed all over Europe, and we also have an EU-Japan broader approach collaboration. Um, as I already said, we operate in cycles. With all these samples, we have thousands of measured and analyzed um, data points, and um, the results provide us with direct analysis of how um, materials are eroded, deposited, and the fuel retention. So to give you a flavor of the um, techniques that we use, we've got ion beam analysis techniques uh, with backscattering, nuclear reaction, um, elastic recoil, SIMS, microbeam, um, desorption techniques to look at fuel, so uh, temperature desorption or laser-induced spectroscopy. And we have many microstructural and um, analytical techniques using electron microscopy, a Raman, and then tritium analysis tools as well with scintillation, total combustion. So this gives you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So material migrations in the middle, and these are all the things that are um, going to uh, provide information about material migration. And, um, okay, and so I'll be talking about erosion and deposition, fuel retention and desorption, a little bit about dust, but this talk will be followed by a talk by Marek Rubel, where he will talk a lot more about dust, material properties, and um, then looking at the impact of all of this on diagnostics. A little bit hesitant, because I now realize this is not my most up-to-date version of the talk, but this is fine. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll start with material erosion. So material is eroded by incoming atoms, so you can have physical sputtering, iron or impurity, Fuel or impurity iron can knock out uh, material from the plasma facing wall. We can also have chemical processes here, which I've tried to um, show whereby we have um, fuel ions actually uh, forming um, hydro hydrogen uh, compounds. Should I say this? Molecules, subject of the last uh, debate. 
Uh, and then we have depositions. So uh, what's eroded or what comes from the plasma can be deposited and we can get co-deposition with fuel and also material mixing with other um, elements. So what is the overall um, understanding of global erosion and deposition? Well, we have, um, we operate the uh, pulse. We have a limiter configuration when we're starting up the pulse. And then um, when we get into the pulse, we have a diverter configuration where we have um, strike points forming now in the diverter. During the limiter configuration, we can have uh, interaction of the plasma with these limiter materials. These are the beryllium limit materials. We get erosion in the center of a tile and then we get deposition in uh, plasma remote surfaces. Um, in the diverter, we can have now erosion at these strike point areas and most of that material is uh, locally redeposited, about 95% of it just comes straight back to the surface, uh, but some of it can migrate further. Then we also have, in the main chamber, we can have erosion from charge exchange neutrals, so neutrals reaching the outer wall, much further than this beryllium layer, but further out to the inconel wall, which I mentioned at the beginning. And these can provide impurities coming back towards the plasma, um, and then eventually they make it to the scrape-off layer and come to the inner diverter. So this is basically the answer <laughs> to the question that I've posed at the beginning, but I'll show you some of the results as we go along. So how has post-mortem analysis helped us come to this conclusion? So in the limiter plasma, uh, we have erosion in the main, um, in the center of a tile. So I'm talking about a tile on this location here. Uh, we measured it with uh, a simple uh, profile um, system. We've measured sort of 50 microns of erosion right in the center. And then we have material that's eroded from here, eventually making it to the edges of the tile, which are curved. And I, this is one of the things I didn't add. I haven't got in my latest, I had in my latest talk. Um, there's a curve. And so these areas are out of the plasma. And once the deposit reaches here, they stay here. So this is just a, an image of one of the deposits that found. So we have these layered deposits. And after a operation, we've got at least 10 microns or more of material being deposited on the ends of um, limiter tiles. So this is the basic process that's going on in the limiter um, plasma. Now I'm going to move on to the diverter plasma. So now we've got strike points in the diverter. And the main source, we have uh, beryllium, which is eroded elsewhere, it makes it through the scrape off layer and makes it to this area. And this is the area where we have most of our deposition in jet. Um, it's beryllium dominant um, deposit. Um, and when we take out tiles from JET, we can see how the um, varied experimental campaign influences where we have deposits. So, for example, in this region here, you might have um, erosion and then prompt redeposition. But because we operate a varied uh, campaign, then the strike point might be here another time. So we're constantly eroding and re-eroding material in this region and eventually it moves out into the corner. But if we have um, predominantly this type of um, uh, campaign, then we definitely get material building up in this region here. So we can see this uh, more directly now. So this is what I called the prompt redeposition. So in one of our campaigns, <coughs> sorry, so when we have the strike point here, we've got this redeposition. This is a, uh, an iron, an iron, a reionized uh, uh, atom coming back to the surface, and we can see this directly. We can see this type of deposit building up, and then we can see this in cross section uh, in this region. But there's also an opportunity for um, eroded atoms to uh, neutrals to go further. So if they don't get reionized they can travel right out into the corner. So we're talking this corner here and be deposited. And here you can see that 
we have this um, clip, which is a clip that we can put into the vessel using a remote handling instrument. And um, we see beryllium, carbon, tungsten, and other elements all deposited in this region. So we have this neutral um, line of sight transport into the corners. Just continuing a little bit more about how the uh, strike point configurations influence the data. So I'm looking, I'm looking at this tile here from two different operating periods. So in the first operating period, our strike point was mostly in this position, and we had a fairly uniform um, deposition of beryllium along this surface. So this is the blue um, dots here. These, this gray shows how the strike point was distributed along this region. But when we had the second operating period, the strike point tended to be further out in the corner, and now we see this build-up of material here, which I showed you earlier. So this really does show you that uh, the overall result is a direct, um, uh, direct result of the uh, strike of the configurations that we used. We've also tried to measure the amount of erosion. So this is an experiment um, where we measured the erosion on the beryllium. So we had here a coating, which we measured the thickness of the coating before and after it was put in the vessel. And we were able to establish that around uh, three microns of material has been eroded from this region during um, the operations. So now I'm going to move on to the uh, charge exchange neutral erosion, which I also mentioned earlier. So now we're talking about in the um, diverter configuration, charge exchange neutrals reaching right out uh, of the plasma to the inner wall and to the outer wall. And we had an experiment where we had these small tokens which were placed at the inner wall, so in this type of location, and they had nickel, and, uh, sorry, beryllium and tungsten on them and we made a direct measurement of the amount of erosion due to the charge exchange neutrals. And then, um, so we've managed to establish these erosion rates. And then I've done some work to try and establish from these values the erosion rate of um, uh, nickel at the outer wall. So what we found is that we've got a source from the charge exchange neutrals of um, beryllium from the main here, but we've also got a, a source from the in canal, because this in canal makes up 60% of the main chamber surface, so it's actually a considerable source here. So now I'm going to move on to fuel retention and, desorp and uh, desorption studies. So now the fuel retention can be via implantation or by co-deposition of uh, uh, fuel ions with um, other plasma facing materials and other impurities. So here we're looking at this side now. So here's the co-deposition of fuel into the surface and then here we can have implantation. And then uh, fuel can be desorbed as well if we reach um, uh, at higher temperatures. So the fuel retention is mainly dominated by this process which is co-deposition. And this is because you've got continuous growth. The fuel is being deposited continuously with, uh, with impurities, and this just, these uh, deposits just uh, gradually get thicker. So I mentioned earlier as well that our main uh, location for deposition is at the top here of the diverter. And, um, We've now looked at the fuel retention along the whole of the diverter. So this is a plot around this surface. So this top region here, this is where most of our fuel is deposited. So again, this is evidence that fuel, is um, fuel retention is still dominated by co-deposition. Um, I put this in as well. There's not so much fuel retention and now looking at this region here. Um, the fuel retention is lower in this region because we don't have so much deposition, but it, this, these results show two nice things. 
Firstly, um, it shows that the, inver the fuel retention is inversely proportional to temperature. So here, if you go this way, so along this region, we've got um, lower temperatures here because the strike point doesn't reach this region. And eventually we have most strike points here where the temperature is highest. So this is in this direction. And here you see fuel retention decreasing to this location. But then once you go further out, although this is maybe cooler, we've now got deposit forming. So here there's beryllium forming on the edge and then the fuel retention starts to go up. So again, this shows us again how uh, fuel retention um, happens in the diverter. Now coming back to the limiter uh, plasmas. So this is the type of plasmas we have during startup. Again, we see the same types of things. We have here I'm showing uh, fuel retention in three different places along a limiter. So this is in the central region and where the plasma interacts with the surface. This is an infrared image. We can see that fuel retention is low. This is where we have most erosion, highest temperatures. And then where we have this deposit, which I showed in the, uh, near at the beginning of the talk, we can see that the fuel is increasing. Then at the top, we have very little interaction with the plasma. So we have just a background of fuel uh, accumulating here. And then at the bottom here, we have this region, which again gets hotter. And then we have deposits on the ends, and then this is maybe just the background level. Not only do we have fuel retention on the surfaces, but we also have to worry about fuel retention in gaps. So when we operate a real tokamak, um, getting to uh, re removing fuel from gaps probably will be more problematic than moving, removing from the surface. So we've now evaluated. Uh, fuel retention from the top surface into a gap. And here you can see that the um, concentration of uh, fuel and other elements decreases um, and drops to very low concentrations at around a millimeter. So this is for a gap of 0.4 millimeters. Now, in JET, we have seven kilometers of uh, gaps, castellations, which we have in our beryllium tiles. So this could contribute a reason, uh, some amount to the overall fuel retention, and we've estimated this to be around 3% of the fuel retention. Um, Modelling shows, maybe fairly obviously, that if we have a bigger gap, we have more deposition in a gap. So the message really is keep your gaps small if you want to reduce fuel. So having taken all these data, then we try and um, understand the global fuel retention in the machine. And um, so we're extrapolating from the data around the machine. And here we can see that we've got um, most of our fuel at the inner diverter, but we have some at the outer diverter and some in these remote regions. And then, as I said, the bulk tungsten was a small amount. And then in the main chamber, uh, most of the retention is on the limiters with a small amount in the gaps. So overall, 0.3% of what we of the injected fuel ends up on the jet chamber wall, um, <coughs> which is significantly lower than we had with the carbon wall. So now just a few words about dust. I'll leave most of it to Marek. Um, we vacuum, each shutdown, we vacuum the surfaces around the diverter. And over the last three um, operating periods, we've collected less than two grams per operating period. So this is significantly lower than we had with the carbon wall, which was around 300 grams. Um, and we have also now evaluated the deuterium, um, specific deuterium, uh, content of the dust and we believe that this three grams contributes less than one percent to the global fuel retention. Another aspect is um, the dust production factor so how um, dust how efficiently is dust produced and in the carbon wall I think it was fairly obvious that dust was coming from the disintegration of deposits so if we make this assumption now for the etalite wall we we have um, 60 grams of deposit 
forming in the diverter, and we have less than two grams being collected. So our conversion factor is much lower, is 4% now with the metal wall, and the beryllium metallic deposits are not disintegrating or not over 60 hours of plasma operations. This is, again, much lower than we had with the carbon wall, which was 43%. So more from Marek in the next talk. Now, moving on to material properties, um, I don't have any real results on thermal mechanical properties to show you, but I'd like to show you something about surface morphology in the microstructure. So just here, is, this is an image of all sorts of um, uh, surfaces that we have in jet. So all these things can happen. Here, this is a beryllium, a piece of a beryllium tile. And you can see that this is, this is melted in some regions. I think we have deposit in these other regions. So there's quite a significant change in the surface morphology um, when it's exposed to plasma. Uh, the bottom left here, this is the surface of our bulk tungsten tile. So this is the, at the very bottom of the machine. This is actually the initial surface. Um, actually, we now have images from the final surface as well, and it's not that much different. So it's sort of fairly rough and stays reasonably rough as well. Uh, next, bottom right here, this is the deposit from the top of the inner diverter. So this is the um, beryllium-rich deposits where most of our fuels stored. It looks very rough, but actually it's quite integral. It's not easily uh, removed from the surface. Um, so as I said, our beryllium deposits are not disintegrating. And then these images here are all of the carbon fiber uh, composite with tungsten coating. So here you see this is the tungsten coating on, a comp on the CFC which you don't see below. And you can see that um, beryllium accumulates in the valleys um, of this uh, rough surface. And to even more extremes, you can see the carbon fiber composites exposed. This is the tungsten coating and then the beryllium um, is uh, in the valleys. And actually, this is where I should have gone. So you've got ions coming in, eroding the surface, and moving material into these valleys uh, where fuel remains, and deposits and fuel remain. Melting is also a source of erosion in jet, and we, um, we do see melting. So at the top of the divert, uh, sorry, the top of the main chamber here, we've seen melting of the dump plate. So this is a dump plate, and then we have melting along the dump plate, and we have quite a lot of melting at the ends. Now, most of this melting occurred during an intentional experiment, uh, vertical displace exper displacement experiment. So the plasma was on purpose moved up to the top of the vessel um, and causes melting. So this type of melting, the peak of the tile has been removed, so over 100 microns of materials lost at the surface here. And in cross-section from this region, you can see that the melt uh, region is um, several hundred uh, microns. And now we have cracking as well through this melt region. So we have the molten layers forming, but also you can see there must be some changes in the mechanical properties um, in this surface due to melting. Other forms of melting that we also see when we have runaway electrons, you get more of this splash-like behavior. You have a runaway electron hitting here, materials heated and splashed out from the surface. Looking more at the microstructure now, um, okay, we have, <clears throat> this is an image showing um, Raman spectroscopy a schematic of the Raman spectroscopy uh, analysis of the surface of a beryllium tile. And we were able to see okay, beryllium oxides, but also um, some deuterium bound with oxygen. Um, the stoichiometry is, uh, uh, is not um, for a beryllium deuteride molecule, but we do have deuterium here. Um, and we've looked at, we see beryllium, beryllium oxide islands growing. And we believe that the, the pulsed nature of jet actually enhances the growth of the beryllium oxide islands. So we have this uh, schematic of oxygen oxides forming at the surface, 
then when the uh, surface is heated again, then beryllium can diffuse through that oxide, and then that's then oxidized, and this can continue and, and uh, develop some um, develop these types of oxide uh, islands in the material. So now, how do all these impact on diagnostics? I'm going to talk about mirrors, infrared thermography, windows, and ports. So mirrors are going to be used widely in, um, in ITER and for the optical diagnostics. And in JET, we also have many mirrors. But these are quite difficult for us to remove and analyze. So we had a, a dedicated experiment and put in some samples into various regions in the jet vessel. So here, this is what the cassette looks like, which holds the mirror. So you've got one mirror at the surface, and then you've got uh, four mirrors recessed into these channels. And these are uh, installed at the outer wall, and then at the inner diverter, outer diverter, and under the base. So that's in these regions here. So mirrors located in the, in the diverter, um, their reflectivity is significantly reduced. So here you see the reflectivity of the initial mirror, and then you get deposits forming on the surface, even flaking deposits. And this reduces um, reflectivity by up to 80%. And of course, we've got deposits forming on the surface here, um, at least um, 500 nanometers of material deposited. And you can see that the nature of these deposits is very non-uniform. So this is a very challenging situation for cleaning mirrors um, because you need to know what these, uh, these deposits are, how thick they are, and um, actually uh, choosing the right conditions for cleaning could be very challenging. At the outer wall, um, actually the total reflectivity of the mirrors doesn't change that much. But what we do find is that the diffuse reflectivity does um, increase. And this is, so here you have the diffuse reflectivity of the original mirror, and then you can see the diffuse reflectivity is increased for some of these samples. And this one at the top here is the one that was right at the front of the cassette. So this is due to uh, changes in roughness at the surface. So we've got erosion going on at the surface. Um, but overall, we have very low um, impurities, so deposition on the surface. So our main changes associated with roughness. Just also, just to say that we see many particles on the mirrors. Again, this will be challenging for cleaning. So uh, I'm sure Barrick will mention these. But we see beryllium. Um, in canal based tungsten, some deposit, and also beryllium splashes. So, everything. Now, coming to the near infrared um, thermography, this is something we use in JET, which is a real time system where we're looking at the, surf the temperature of the tiles um, using infrared cameras. And we're trying to make sure that we don't exceed certain temperatures. So we don't want the beryllium tiles to exceed 950 degrees centigrade. The tungsten coated CFC, we are trying to minimize to below 1,120. And the bulk tungsten, 1,000 degrees centigrade. So for the beryllium, we were trying to avoid melting. For the tungsten coated CFC, we're actually trying to avoid damaging the coating. And in the bulk tungsten, this whole um, structure is limited to a thousand degrees but because of the way it's held together so this is actually to avoid failure and fatigue of the tungsten so we have a series of infrared cameras around the vessel and here for example take this yellow one here this is viewing in this cone so you can see the inner wall here and the outer wall and there are many cameras and i show you just a couple of images one showing the inner wall and the outer wall, and one showing the diverter. So when we look at um, a mirror, sorry, infrared um, image from the diverter here, I've scaled this just to, to make my point. There's obviously temperature data from all over. But what I want to show you is that the infrared thermography data coming to us is um, can 
vary as a result of deposition or erosion on the surface. So here, composition and density of deposits, thermal adhesion of deposits, morphology and roughness, um, and implanted surfaces, these can all affect the data that you get from your IR camera. And here I show one tile that we took out to be analysed and a new one's been put in. And you can already see the effect. This is the tile where we have this high, high amount of deposit. So we have this rough um, deposit, which I showed you earlier, which is quite thick, like several uh, tens of microns, whereas the new tile doesn't have a deposit or has a very thin deposit. So you can already see that the infrared is very different. And if you want to use this for real-time feedback to protect a surface, what do you take? Is this a problem for us? Well, actually, the heating of the deposits isn't a problem. It's the heating of the coating which is the problem. So it, it, it gives us a real challenge to understand um, which thermal data we should be feeding back to our real-time system. This is another situation, and this actual... Um, situation stopped a pulse. So our real-time system can stop a pulse if we exceed the temperature limits. So again, I've scaled it just to make my point, but here is a point that was picked up by the real-time system as being too hot. So here I show these are all the regions of interest which are being analysed by the system. And in this region of interest, this particular point was too hot. And again, here's the plot. And here's the threshold temperature, and here's where we exceed the threshold temperature for more than 400 milliseconds. And this arose because of some roughness here. This is probably deposition, and uh, some, uh, now that we're getting some heating, so we've got a really rough area. But again, we might not consider this to be detrimental to our um, operations. Um, so yeah, we lose a pulse, but whether we lost it for the right reasons uh, is questionable. I mean, there are areas, in general, we, we are able to protect the whole system, but these anomalies do crop up and we, we have to review them and then we have to understand whether we're going to keep using this in our real-time system. And then, um, I mentioned mirrors, of course, these are uh, affected by deposits, but windows are also affected deposit affected by deposition and um, uh, so here I show just um, some information about windows so we took out a window and we had this laser cleaned outside of the vessel um, here's the deposit here's the laser cleaned area and before cleaning the transmission was fairly low in the 40 to 50 percent and then after cleaning we've now um, increased this back up to more like 70 or 80 percent so you can see that deposition has a real effect on um, optical uh, diagnostics and we need to understand how it changes over time and our degradation of mirror of windows we understand for this particular diagnostic which is in the visible spectroscopy range we are losing 15 percent losses over 10,000 discharges. So again, these are things that we need to understand. And then finally, maybe this is a bit um, left field, should I say. The effect of dust migration and debris on diagnostics. I'm not actually saying that we affect a diagnostic, but we do have um, a situation where debris or dust can fall onto vacuum ports. And we have had this happen in JET. So this is a picture taken in this subdiverter region, right at the bottom, below the diverter. We can't access it very easily, but we've managed to put an endoscope down into the diverter. And this is debris and uh, dust from the carbon wall, but it's still there, I hasten to add, because we haven't vacuumed it out. And we have had a situation where um, Dust and debris has made it onto a vacuum port, which we open and close to protect our diagnostics. And um, if we get dust onto a seal on a vacuum gate, then we can have a permanent leak. Now, if you open and close that seal, it may eventually go away. But we have had a situation where we believe we've actually scratched a vacuum port and we have a permanent leak, which we have to live with or we have to exchange. Um, in recent times, we, we lived with it because... Uh, 
the leak wasn't so great. So I'd like to summarise now. I hope I've shown you some elements of material migration. So we have erosion sources in the main chamber from the limiters during limiter plasma and um, during the diverter plasmas from charge exchange neutrals. And then we also have erosion happening in the diverter at the strike point locations. Uh, material migration, um, material migrates uh, around the scrape off layer and we have most of our deposition at the top of the inner diverter. The patterns of deposition that we have are very much influenced by the plasma configurations um, and it is possible to have migration into remote areas uh, away from plasma uh, operations. Our fuel retention is mostly dominated by co-deposition in the diverter and is at the order of 0.3% of injected fuel and we also have uh, retention in gaps at the level of a few percent. The amount of dust we collect is less than two grams um, and the dust production levels are low in the jet eater light wall. And then in terms of the effects of all these on diagnostics, um, these really have effects on optical components such as mirrors and windows. Um, they have an effect on the infrared thermography that you may be doing in a vessel and they can have a detrimental effect on actually operating vacuum ports linked with diagnostics. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Question, please. I have three quick questions. First of all, how thick is the coating of the beryllium on the in canal? Um, our coating on the in canal, I believe it's, I don't know. I know how much our samples were, which is about uh, seven or eight microns, but I, the eight final. Microns eight microns. Eight microns. Was eight microns? I didn't know whether, okay. Okay, eight microns. Then. Okay. And uh, the beryllium deposits, are they porous? And if so, about what is their density compared with okay. solid beryllium? They are, well, they're layered. And we, we've not actually measured their porosity, I have to say. Um, I imagine they are fairly porous. I don't know if the Marek has or not. I would say they're not, they're not dense. Okay. I, can't, I can't give you a value at this point, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Third question is, we've got dirty windows too. Why can't you use lasers to clean them from the outside, shining the laser okay. through this, the window? Actually, this work I showed you was in preparation for doing exactly this. But we, the thing is, in JET, we don't just... Um, we have to test everything before we actually implement it. One of the issues we haven't sorted out, though, is when you do ablate the material from the inside, where does it go? Do you just, where do you, do you just send material somewhere else? So at the moment in JET, we've never implemented this cleaning from the outside. But you we, think it could be done? Uh, yeah, we think it could be done. And this is what this, these oh, results right. were trying to test this. But we haven't, we haven't got to the stage where we can actually implement it. A very nice presentation. Thank you for that. I have plenty of questions, but I will restrict myself to only a few. One is uh, very general. So, do you think so? ITER was a jet was supposed to test ITER choice of materials. Is it a good choice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not a plasma physicist. Okay, in terms of operating the machine. I think you probably can just about operate it without melting all your beryllium. You will melt beryllium, no doubt. But my feeling is that the, the jet vessel sort of molds itself to what your operating <coughs> conditions are. So you're, where you've got things sticking out that melt, eventually this will melt and move somewhere else, and then it will be fine. Also, um, impurities that are problematic they will be eroded and redeposited, but eventually they just disappear into the corner. <laughs> so, so I think I think you might get away with it. 
Good, thank you. And the second question is more specific. For the infrared, you use new IR cameras, and we actually had to go away from this because we, our observation was strongly polluted by molecular lines. So we had to go beyond 4.1 microns, actually, to be able to observe. So do you, do you have this effect of, of uh, molecular lines uh, polluting your um, infrared spectrum? I don't know whether I can answer that because I'm not from the infrared thermography group, but uh, we do have some cameras operating at four microns. So I think this is probably the reason why. I don't know, but <laughs> okay. it's clearly it comes from the plasma and not from the wall. So yeah, but it's... Uh, I mean, we do, yeah, we do see plasma radiation as well, and this can be uh, a bit confusing, so... But generally, we manage that. Generally, that doesn't cause us a problem in terms of the real time uh, um, temperature analysis that we need to do because we look in areas where we don't get this uh, excitation from the plasma. Okay. But I mean, you, you showed these places where you, you detected hotspots, where clearly you look through the plasma on, on them, so this could affect it. Yeah, uh, yeah but these, uh, yeah, but sometimes the hotspots. Okay. Well, these hotspots then are hotter than what we see in the plasma. Okay. Question what? I don't know, I've not seen. Central, ah, yeah, this is. So in uh, your slide number 10, so you show the uh, deposition profile, a deposition and the erosion profile on in, in both side limiter. And uh, there, there is a very clear difference between the uh, electron drift side and the uh, ion drift side, the position. So uh, do you have any uh, opinion which, why such a difference appears? Um, I don't have any opinion on this at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I can't give you any answer at the moment, I'm afraid, Masazaki san <laughs> But it is something I've been wondering about, but it's not resolved. Thank you again.